Welcome to this ERS webinar. I'm Anita Simons. I'm the current president. The topic of this webinar is vaccines for coronavirus, their development, their regulation, the immune response to COVID and the immune response to the vaccine. So it's hard to think of a more timely and relevant topic. Vaccines are obviously crucial globally to help end the pandemic. They're important to our patients, they're important to our families, and they're important to us personally. Of course, we're here to discuss the science and not the politics. We have two great speakers today, and the format is that we'll have the first and then the second presentation, and then we'll go to the questions. Uh, while you're listening to the speakers, please put your questions in the chat box, the chat box, not the Q&A box. Uh, and we look forward to um, seeing your questions. And with that, I'll hand on to Professor Tobias Felt, our past president, to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Anita, thank you very much. Welcome. I'm really, really impressed about the number of participants. And I think, I hope you will not be disappointed after this webinar, but I'm sure we will get a, a mess of new information. And with this, COVID-19 is something which is more than a hot topic today, and vaccination is seen as the light of the end of the tunnel out of the corona pandemia. So everything what is uh, reported about vaccination is of major interest. And for today, we invited two fantastic speakers, Professor Rosemary Boyton, Anita will come back to introduce her later on, and Dr. Marco Cavalleri. Dr. Marco Cavalleri is the head of the Office of Biological Health Threats and Vaccine Strategy in the European Medical Association now in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and I know him for a very long time. He is a very experienced, but also very pragmatic scientist who knows everything about the regulatory properties uh, in infectious disease and mainly in uh, vaccine development. Marco, a great pleasure to have you here, and we are excited to hear your talk. Thank you very much, Tobias, for your kind words. So uh, I'm ready to start my presentation. If I can have the slides on screen. Marco, please, please come on the screen. And you will be able to control the slides. Okay, so indeed in my talk, uh, I will go through uh, the experience that we have so far with COVID-19 vaccines uh, from a regulatory standpoint. And uh, in particular, I will focus on the vaccines that we have already approved. So as you know, there are many vaccines under development for COVID-19 using different technology. The majority of them are using the spike protein as the key antigen for their vaccine for a number of very good reasons. Some of them are focusing just on a portion of the spike protein, so the receptor binding domain called RBD, as you see on this slide. But I have to admit that the vast majority are focusing on the entirety of the spike protein. Then there are also a few vaccines that are using the entirety of the virus, so with the inactivated virus vaccines under development as the two that have been brought forward from China as an example. But I said today my focus will be really on two specific technology. First of all, the one that is called uh, under H here, so which are the replication incompetent vector vaccine uh, and in particular, the one that used the chimpanzee adenovirus free as the vector. And also the one that are under I here at the bottom of this slide. So the RNA vaccine uh, that are encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles. As you know, two vaccines have been approved by DMA using this technology. So 
let's start uh, with uh, uh, some information around uh, uh, the vaccines uh, using messenger RNA technology. As you know, this vaccine has provided very good efficacy based on very large placebo-controlled randomized clinical trials with an efficacy around 94-95% in terms of prevention of uh, PCR-confirmed symptomatic COVID-19. These vaccines uh, have uh, been able to reach such high level of efficacy following a two-dose schedule, uh, essentially with two doses given three weeks apart for the Pfizer-BioNTech and four weeks apart for the Moderna one. Here on this slide, you see what is the immunogenicity in terms of uh, neutralizing antibodies after a first dose and after the booster dose later on. So you can see here day 21, what is the level of neutralizing antibodies in adults for this vaccine? And at day 28, you see what is the level of neutralizing antibodies after the boost. And you can clearly see that there is quite a significant increase in terms of the amount of neutralizing antibodies that can be elicited after the second dose. While after the first dose and in this very limited period of time, the amount of neutralizing antibodies are very low and close even to the limit of quantification. So this is something that, of course, was the main reason why developers for this messenger RNA vaccine decided to go with two doses regimens. And here you see what happens in a population composed of elderly from above 65 years of age up to 85 years of age. And you clearly see pretty much the same pattern. But what is important to note is that the level of neutralizing antibodies using the 30 microgram dose, which is the one that got approved at the end, is uh, uh, providing quite high level of these antibodies, these functional antibodies, and not too far away from what we're seeing with adults in general, which is extremely reassuring and is not what we normally see with other uh, technologies or more traditional vaccine, as indeed here the immunogenicity in the elderly seems to be maintained with this technology, which is quite remarkable and a very important feature of this type of vaccines. Something very similar has been seen also with the Moderna vaccine, which is a, is a very similar vaccine using messenger RNA encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles. Here, the second dose was given after four weeks. And also here, what you see is at day 29, just before uh, the second dose is given, uh, you see that the level of neutralizing antibody measured with this specific assay are really low and really close to the limit of quantification. Uh, and then you can see at day 43 how much this response is boosted. Also in this slide, you can clearly see that again in the elderly, this level of immunogenicity is maintained after the second dose. And moreover, importantly, we see after approximately three months that this high level of neutralizing antibodies is still maintained, which is extremely reassuring in terms of long-term protection with this type of technology. And again, this is confirming what we have been seeing also with the, the vaccine from Pfizer-BioNTech. So this is a summary of what I just described to you in terms of the differences between the two vaccines and the fact that the second dose should be given with a slightly different interval. Efficacy, as I said, is extremely high in terms of preventing symptomatic COVID of any severity. One difference is, is in the storage temperature for the two vaccines as a Comirnaty, so the Pfizer-BioNTech requires uh, the ultra cold with minus 80 degrees, uh, while the, the Moderna one, uh, you can keep it also minus 20 degrees and it's also possible to keep for a couple of months in the fridge, which of course is something important in the context of mass vaccination campaign to facilitate operations. This is a plot that really shows uh, for the Comirnaty specifically, but it's very similar to what's seen also with, uh, with the Moderna vaccine, that really efficacy starts soon after the first dose, approximately 10, 14 days after the first dose, you start seeing the separation between the placebo arm and the vaccination and the vaccinated group harm, 
uh, we clearly demonstrate that efficacy is apparent even before the booster dose. And this is quite intriguing and fascinating considering what I showed to you before on the fact that the level of neutralizing antibodies are extremely low after a first dose and really close to the limit of quantification. So this has opened up an entire debate around whether protection after a single dose would be prolonged with this type of technology. The fact is that we don't really know at this stage. And again, the fact that the level of neutralizing antibodies are so low is something that might be not so reassuring, particularly long, in the long term, and whether really a single shot of this vaccine would be the best way forward in ensuring that a suitable amount of protection is confirmed to confer to the vaccinees. But of course, we don't have yet a correct of protection for this vaccine. It would be very interesting to investigate further what is happening after a single shot versus two doses and what could be the main driver for the protection seen in the first three to four weeks. Few words about the safety of these messenger RNA vaccines. Overall, the safety profile is adequate for, for a vaccine like this one. Essentially, we are talking about reactogenicity, we can be, which can be mild to moderate. And here you see on this slide uh, depicting what has been the systemic reactogenicity after the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, clearly showing that after the second dose, reactogenicity tends to be higher uh, in terms of fatigue, headache, and muscle pain which are the main signs of reactogenicity seen with this vaccine, and pretty much the same pattern has been seen also with the Moderna vaccine. Now, as you know, in Europe, once a new vaccine gets approval or any medicinal product, you have to have a risk management plan in place with a clear cut definition of what are the safety specification of the vaccine and what will need to be followed up in the post-approval phase. The only important identified risk so far has been anaphylaxis, which is the same for both the Moderna vaccine, for which this slide is about, but also Comirnatis or the Pfizer-BioNTech. An important potential risk is still the possibility of enhancement of disease once the antibodies go down particularly, but this seems to be rather theoretical at this stage, and we are not as concerned as we were at the beginning of the development of this vaccine around the potential of enhancement of disease. Nevertheless, we will monitor closely once the vaccine are in use and particularly in the long run, once antibodies will decay to see whether there is any risk associated in this direction. Missing information covered the use in pregnancy, the long-term safety, the use in immunocompromised subject, interaction with other vaccine and use in frail subject, and last but not least, the use in subject without immune or inflammatory disorders. And this is a summary for the two vaccine of what has been the recommendation in the summary of product characteristic that we have been agreeing uh, in, the, in the free area of pregnant women, immunocompromised and hypersensitivity and anaphylaxis. You will see that the wording is really similar or even identical uh, in cases. Essentially for pregnant women, what we're saying that the experience so far from a clinical perspective is extremely limited. Indeed, very few pregnant women ended up being present in the clinical trials, which essentially excluded pregnant women to start with. But animal data are supported that there is no apparent harm uh, to pregnant women and to the fetus. And therefore, uh, considering that COVID can be quite severe in this uh, vulnerable group, the recommendation would be to carefully balance the benefit and the risk, but anyway, to consider whether administration of this vaccine uh, will be warranted. In terms of immunocompromised subject, we don't have information as indeed this group was excluded from the pivotal clinical trials. And we will try to collect information in the post-approval phase. Nevertheless, it is expected that benefit will be conferred by this vaccine also in this population, despite we may argue that the level of protection, particularly in some of these groups, could be lower than in the general population. With respect to hypersensitivity and anaphylaxis, as you know, events of anaphylaxis have been reported during the vaccination campaigns with these vaccines. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it's very important that appropriate medical treatment and supervision is readily available in case of anaphylactic reaction and close observation is taking place for at least 15 minutes. 
We don't know yet what is causing these cases of anaphylaxis, and we will be investigating to what could be the role played by some of the lipids that are used to encapsulate the messenger RNA. But at this stage, it's very difficult to define what is the root cause of these uh, increased rates of anaphylaxis, which is indeed is a bit higher than what we normally see with vaccines, but still not too much worrisome and not really altering the benefit risk profile of these two vaccines. Now, let's move to the latest vaccine that has been approved by the EMA, which is the, uh, the Shadox-1 COVID-19 vaccine. It's a viral vector vaccine that uses the chimpanzee adenofree as a vector and incorporates the spike protein as uh, the antigen that is delivered into the cell in order to elicit an immune response. Just to mention that the spike protein that has been used in this vaccine is the linearized form, so it's not the trimeric perfusion conformation state that has been used in other vaccines. First of all, as you know, the clinical trials that have been uh, pivotal in order to allow the approval of this vaccine were a bit complex, and some of this complexity is due mainly by two factors. First of all, initially, this vaccine was supposed to be used as a single dose vaccine, and this based on the preliminary data in animal models and the animal models uh, that have been seen with MERS vaccine using the same technology. However, after the vaccine was explored uh, in terms of human immunogenicity, it became clear that giving a second dose would boost the immune response, particularly the, immune, the humoral immune response, and therefore it was defined as potential beneficial. The problem was that uh, some of the pivotal clinical trials to uh, look into efficacy had already started with a single dose. And therefore what happened is that in these clinical trials, a catch-up vaccination took place with a, single, with, a, with a second dose that was administered at different point in time, and therefore ended up with uh, this having occurred uh, according to uh, really an heterogeneous variety of intervals from four weeks up to 26 weeks. And this is, of course, has not simplified the work of regulators in interpreting the data. And, uh, and another important aspect is that initially the first subject that were vaccinated in the larger UK study uh, received uh, as a first dose uh, a lower dose than what was expected. This was later found out and corrected. Nevertheless, there was a subgroup in the clinical trials that received initially a lower dose than what was supposed to be. And therefore, also this subgroup made the interpretation of the data a bit more complex. However, the authorization that has been received by AstraZeneca for this vaccine is based on two standard doses given with an interval of 4 to 12 weeks. And here on this slide, you see in terms of viral neutralization, the advantage that is received by giving a booster dose, either a day 28 or a day 56. Uh, these vaccines are also well known for exerting quite uh, an important uh, um, T-cell immune response. And you see here, based on Helispot, what was the immune response seen after a single dose and after two doses. We don't see really a big boost after the second dose here, but nevertheless, it is notable that there is a, really an activation of cellular immunity with this vaccine. As you know, this vaccine has been approved by the EMA for all age group, despite the clinical trial, we're able to demonstrate uh, the level of protection only up to 55 years of age. The decision to allow the approval and so the definition of a positive benefit risk also in subjects above 55 years of age is based on the fact that the immunogenicity data that you see here based on a validated uh, uh, pseudovirus neutralization assay are showing that the immunogenicity after two doses in elderly above 65 years of age is not very different than what's seen in adults uh, up to 55 years of age. And in particular, if you look uh, at, the, at the table on the right, you can clearly see that adults in the clinical trials that receive two doses with an interval of less than six weeks, the level of GNT in terms of neutralizing antibodies was around 105, which is very close to what's seen with the uh, elderly above 65 years of age on the left 
after two doses, approximately with the same interval, which gave GMTs of around 109. And it's important for me to remark here that uh, the longer is the interval between the two doses, the better is the effect of the booster in terms of immunogenicity, both binding antibody and neutralizing antibodies, which would support it for the sense, uh, for the sake of a longer term protection, that a longer interval might be preferable. And this is are the data that we have been assessing according to dif two different cutoff uh, of the various clinical trials. As you know, there is a study that has been running in the UK, as I mentioned before, but also a study that has been running in Brazil, both quite large studies. And uh, however, this, uh, the pooled analysis that was derived by merging the efficacy data from these two studies and using an interval of four to 12 weeks using just two standard doses limited the efficacy analysis set. So what you see here is that the safety data set is much larger with 12,000 subjects in the vaccine group and almost the same in the control group. While for the efficacy analysis set, this is much smaller with almost 6,000 in each group. And as you can clearly see here, also we had to take away the number of subjects that receive a low dose initially, as indeed our focus has been just on two standard doses separated by the interval of four to 12 weeks. So this is what you see in terms of result from the pooled analysis of the efficacy from the study in the UK and the study in Brazil. And you can clearly see here that at the bottom of this figure, uh, that there is a difference also in terms of efficacy if the second dose was given a different interval. So the post-dose 2 efficacy seems to be slightly better if you wait a bit longer, which will be uh, coherent with what we're seeing in terms of immunogenicity after the booster dose. Now, this is the, the analysis based on the most recent data cutoff, which is from the 7th of December. So more mature data than what I showed you before and what has been put into the Lancet publication in December. And you can see here that we come up with an efficacy estimate for the two standard doses with an interval of four to 12 weeks of around 59.5%. And you see here that the number of events indeed are much more than what's seen in the Lancet publication and in the recent precedent cutoff. We are also reporting that the vaccine efficacy was 62.6% in participants receiving the two recommended dose, but with any dose interval. So intervals that go much behind the 12 weeks, that is what has been approved. So ranging from three to 23 weeks in a specified analysis. And here you see what is happening across the different studies. So from the UK and Brazil in terms of the efficacy after different interval, as I mentioned to you before, there is a clear trend that if you wait a bit longer, efficacy after the booster might be better. But importantly would be what happens after the first dose because if we can assume that there is something to gain in terms of immunogenicity and protection after a booster dose later on, it's important to be sure that the protection conferred after a first dose is suitable for such an interval. So at the very least, since the, the, the approval has been for an interval that can be as long as 12 weeks, that we have sufficient data to show that the protection after a first dose is suitable. Here you see on this plot that indeed after 21 days after the first dose, there is already protection that is coming up as evident. And this protection is carried on forwards later on. So this uh, is something that will show us that indeed a first dose will be protective. Now, when it comes to define precisely how much is this protection up to 12 weeks, that is not easy to say, as indeed, as you see here in this table, the data from the UK study, if you look at protection after a first dose and 21 days after the first dose, up to a dose two censored at 12 weeks is very different in the UK study and in the Brazilian study. In the UK, the efficacy was around 44% up to 12 weeks, while in the Brazilian study was 80%. So the average comes up to be 73%, but we are not sure if this is, is a proper estimate of efficacy up to the time point of 12 weeks. 
And importantly, I need to stress that in the Brazilian study, the majority of the subject received the second dose within seven weeks. So the interval between the first dose and the second dose is extremely limited. Uh, while in the UK study, the majority of the subject received the second dose much later and even 12 weeks or later. So therefore, if we want to be conservative for an interval of 12 weeks, maybe what is emerging from the UK study is a more precise estimate. However, for us, it's been really not possible to put into the SMPC a precise estimate of protection after a first dose and up to the period of 12 weeks with the data that we have. An important point is, of course, around the protection from severe disease and hospitalization. And here on the left, you see what we included in the SMPC, which essentially there were zero cases of hospitalization in participants that received two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine versus eight cases for the control. And uh, if we look at all participants who receive at least one dose from 22 days post dose one, there were zero cases of hospitalization in those that received the AstraZeneca vaccine compared to 14 in the control group, including one fatality. And uh, you see here on the plot on the right, that clearly shows that this vaccine, despite the number are rather small, is able to prevent hospitalization and severe disease which we believe is, is a very important factor despite the limitation in the current data and post-approval effectiveness studies will be very important in confirming to what extent this vaccine is able to protect from severe disease. But also let me also stress that these data are not different than what's seen with the Moderna vaccine, which had more cases of severe disease and hospitalization than the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. So in terms of safety, also here, essentially, mainly reactogenicity has been seen with the, with the typical uh, systemic and local signs of reactogenicity after the first dose and the second dose, with, more, uh, with most of these systemic adverse events being mild to moderate. Uh, then there have been other adverse events of special interest that we followed. Uh, you know the case of transverse myelitis that was reported while the trials were ongoing and that put on all, the, uh, all of them. Uh, this was a single case and uh, we have been looking quite carefully at all the neuroinflammatory adverse event to make sure of what, that there was not an imbalance in these cases or any case that was particularly problematic or could be causally correlated to the vaccine. For the time being, there is nothing that is particularly worrisome. But of course, uh, this entire area of adverse event to special interest will be followed quite closely in the post-approval phase. So in conclusion, different technologies are under investigation. Uh, we have seen uh, in these uh, clinical trials that the benefit according to the primary endpoint was reduction in COVID-19 disease of any severity. Uh, the uncertainties refer to the long-term protection and the community transmission. Uh, so that's why it's important to maintain uh, uh, social distancing uh, practices and the use of face masks until we have more data with respect to the ability of this vaccine to protect from transmission. Messenger RNA vaccine required two doses, but the efficacy was very high and the safety was adequate. Uh, the interval uh, between the two doses of the messenger RNA vaccine should be maintained as much as possible in line with the SMPC and according to what I showed to you uh, related to the uncertainties of the immune response after a single dose. Subject with comorbidities including cancer patients were included in clinical trials uh, but not immunocompromised patients and post-approval studies will cover randomized clinical trials in selected immunocompromised patients and effectiveness studies will be extremely important in order to understand what is the impact of this vaccine on morbidity, mortality, and transmission, and therefore in order to reach herd immunity. Thank you very much. Marco, that's Marcos, tremendous. thank you very much for this brilliant talk. We will have a little bit more time later on for discussion. Mm -hmm. And with this, I want to hand over to Anita to introduce Rosemary. Thank you. And so Rosemary Boyton uh, is Professor of Immunology in the Adult Infectious Diseases Department at Imperial College. Um, not only is she a lab-based immunologist, she's also a clinician too. And Rosemary is going to speak on the host immunity to SARS-CoV infection and the immune response following vaccination. Thanks, Rosemary. <laughs> 
So thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be speaking to the ERS today about this. And I'm going to be talking about, as Anita said, host immunity to mild and asymptomatic infection. And then a little bit about what happens following vaccination. And this is probably the most important group to think about because it's what most people are actually having. Um, so we all know the timeline of key events in the COVID-19 outbreak and its emergence and spread starting in December 2019 with lockdowns and the World Health Organization def defining a pandemic in March. And then as we got to December, there was much hope because we saw the vaccines rolling out um, and getting approved um, with really excellent efficacies. And that was an amazing achievement by the immunologists and the vaccinologists. Um, but at the same time, we saw the emergence of the SARS-CoV-2 UK variant, the South African variant, um, and also the Brazilian variant. Um, so when we look at the phy phylogeny, what we see is that uh, um, the SARS-CoV-2 is um, very closely um, related to the um, bat coronavirus and the pangolin coronavirus, um, but also to SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV. Uh, with a lot of sequence homology. Um, and when we look at the variant strains that have emerged, what we see is that a lot of the variants, or, or the variants all have um, mutations um, within the spike region, um, and particular, particularly um, that, um, the, that there are mutations that we see across all three variants. So the N501 tyrosine mutation is seen in the UK, the South African, and the Brazilian variant. Um, and really these variants must have a fitness advantage um, to have increased in prevalence so much um, in recent time. Um, and the, one of the advantages is the altered infectivity. So the UK variant is 70% more infectious um, than the authentic strain. Um, but there could also be um, issues with things like escape from B cell immunity, disruption of key epitopes um, that um, are being recognized by the immune system, altered T cell immunity, um, and also generalized resistance um, to neutralization. So all of those factors could be giving a fitness advantage, leading to an increased prevalence of, of these um, mutant strains. So um, when we look at spike protein um, for SARS-CoV-2, Two, what we see is that there is a receptor binding domain and we know that SARS-CoV-2 uses ACE2 um, to bind um, on target and to enter the cells and also this is the target for neutralizing antibodies um, and in the figure on the bottom right um, you can see that there are five critical residues within the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2 and the blue box um, indicates one of the key residues um, that I think is important when we look at the variants, because this is the key residue that has that tyrosine um, that I showed you, which is present in all three of the, of the variant strains. So in order to understand what's going on with any kind of new infection, the first thing that you can do is start to look at um, other infections from the same family of viruses. So we know that we've I previously identified two coronaviruses that cause severe pneumonia, SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV, but these had very limited person-to-person -person spread. And so there were very small numbers relatively of confirmed cases, so 8,100 and 2,500 respectively. Um, the human coronaviruses are incredibly common and incredibly mild, causing the common cold, and there are four of them. Um, and people get recurrent infections um, with um, common colds, despite having neutralizing antibodies um, to them. So we urgently need to understand natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2. We need to understand what are the aspects of the immune response that are protective and how long does that protection last? And we also need to understand correlates of protection associated um, with that, particularly in regard to vaccine efficacy. So when we look at these human coronavirus infections, um, I've just got three little figures here to show you. Um, with the common cold on the, on the left um, of the human coronaviruses, mild symptoms, replication in the nasopharynx, and then rapidly waning immunity with frequent reinfections. So individuals can get reinfections even in the presence of neutralizing antibodies. And there's a lot of evidence in longitudinal serology surveys of, of waning antibodies. 
So about 90% of adults, in fact, have serum antibodies to the human coronaviruses causing the common cold, but they're not protected and they do still get recurrent infections. With SARS-CoV-2 in 2002, we saw the polyfunctional T-cell immunity, even as far as four to six years after infection, in 70 to 80% of patients. And about half of them had um, IgG binding and memory B cell responses after six years. So long-standing immunity, um, and particularly in proportion to disease severity. Um, with um, MERS-CoV, everything was very limited. There was a higher mortality, but it was limited because it was predominantly camel to human transmission. But once again, you saw evidence of uh, T cell immunity uh, and, and quite uh, uh, long standing um, B cell immunity, but only in severe disease. So moving forward, what can we say? Well, we can say that humoral and cellular adaptive immunity are important to protection as are neutralizing antibodies. But there is this huge potential for rapid waning of antibody responses, allowing reinfection, particularly in individuals that have had mild and asymptomatic infection in the human coronaviruses, uh, that causing, causing common cold and also causing MERS-CoV. And this has very important implications for arguments about herd immunity, uh, because herd immunity isn't going to be sustained if people have rapidly waning antibodies. And it also has implications for mass vaccination strategies. Um, because when you vaccinate people, they usually have stronger um, immune responses and more sustained immune responses and the opportunity, obviously, to boost if people's immunity is waned. Um, so our critical questions are do neutralizing antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 or specific T or, or T cells against SARS-CoV-2 prevent disease and transmission? How long does that protection last in natural infection or vaccination? What causes the dysregulated immunity associated with severe disease? And just how can we ensure that vaccines are safe and not associated with enhanced disease? So this is what, what we look at as immunologists for, in the virus to try and work out what's going on. You've got envelope proteins, membrane proteins, nuclear proteins, and obviously the spike protein on the cell surface. And when you drill down to those proteins, there are four main structural proteins. There's spike, nuclear protein, envelope and membrane protein shown in pink, and then all the other non-structural proteins shown in, in, in light blue. So the antibody responses are typically directed against spike and nuclear protein, the neutralizing antibody responses against spike, and the CD4 and CD8 T cell responses are, are, are um, against both the structural and non-structural proteins. So we, we, we've been working in a collaboration with um, uh, the UK COVID Sortium um, um, doing studies to try and understand natural immunity in mild or asymptomatic infection with SARS-CoV-2. And we used a cohort of healthcare workers that were recruited from the day of UK lockdown and followed for six months um, and are still being followed up. Um, and for the first um, six months, they had weekly PCR weekly um, serum um, serology um, and um, they did um, symptom diaries um, and this gave us the opportunity to to follow them over time and identify which individuals had developed um, infection um, by PCR or antibody tests and which ones hadn't and so then we did a cross-sectional analysis where we looked at healthcare workers with laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection um, and those without and we could ask questions about specific T cell responses, neutralizing antibody responses, and the relationship between the two. And within the cohort, approximately 30% of the individuals were completely asymptomatic that became infected. So looking at the infected um, healthcare worker cohort, what, what we're showing you here is the T cell responses. So these have been measured using a technique called T cell Ellie spots, which looks at the gamma interferon response of the T cells. And what you can see is that there are T cell responses against the spike, the nuclear protein, the membrane, and off 3A, 3A and B and 7A. Um, and 85% sorry, of individuals had a, a response um, to nuclear protein. Um, and 49% had a response to spike protein at, 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 at 16 to 18 weeks after um, infection. We also found um, T cell responses in our pre-pandemic controls and also in individuals with laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. So if you look at the groups here, 
These are the individuals with laboratory confirmed infection that I've just shown you. Um, and what the donuts are showing you is the proportion of individuals that are responding by intensity of response. This is showing you the pre-pandemic controls. And what you can see is you've got T cell recognition occurring in individuals who'd never ever met SARS-CoV-2 because they were recruited um, in 2017 to 18. And then these are the healthcare workers who would have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 but never became infected um, in this COVID-19 symptomatic um, and asymptomatic and um, non-case non definition symptomatic. So there's T cell recognition across the board. What we also found was that um, individuals that had um, laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 with case definition symptoms had a stronger T cell response than those um, that were asymptomatic. So you see that there's a stronger response across all the antigens um, that we looked at um, with, within SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this is a very important slide, which is showing the neutralizing antibody teeters. Um, and what, what I'd like to show you is that actually the majority, so 89% of the laboratory confirmed defected healthcare workers in fact made very good neutralizing antibody responses. And if you remember from Marco's talk, he was highlighting 100, an IC50 of um, 100 as being um, you know, in line with the um, responses that seem to be associated with efficacy of the vaccine studies. So, so these are very good T cells, good, sorry, neutralizing antibody responses. And in fact, 66% of these laboratory confirmed individuals had IC50s over 200, which we took to be likely to correlate with um, functional protection based on the published macaque studies at the time. Because uh, when we did this work, um, the um, vaccine studies hadn't at that point been published. What we also found was that the um, female healthcare workers had higher neutralization teeters um, than the male. And indeed, the older healthcare workers had higher neutralization teeters than the male. So those greater than 50, 88% had teeters of IC50 greater than 200, which we think would be protective. And then of the um, lower age groups, um, slightly less, 59% had an IC50, sorry, the slides seem to be running away with me, had an IC50 um, of, of, of um, greater than 200. So older people um, appear to have um, higher, higher levels of protective um, neutralizing antibodies. So the next thing we did was we correlated the um, neutralization teeters um, with the binding antibody tests. And you can see on this far right, um, that there's a very strong positive correlation, but there's also some discordance here um, where you've got individuals which are showing here that have a binding, a positive binding antibody result. This is by the Euroimmune antibody test against Spike S1, um, but they've got no neutralization. So these individuals would have been told they had a positive antibody test, but indeed had no evidence of functional neutralization. The other thing that's happening here is that some of the individuals have had their antibodies have waned over time. So by 16 to 18 weeks, their antibodies have gone from positive to negative by the Euroimmune test. And yet they've still got functional neutralization at a very decent level. So the Euroimmune antibody test and perhaps some other spike uh, one binding antibody tests can be unreliable in terms of um, defining whether or not someone's actually had an infection or whether or not they're indeed still um, protected from infection. The other thing that we noted that I think is really important is an uncoupling and a discordance between the T cell and the neutralizing antibody response. And what I'm showing you here is the neutralizing antibody responses, um, IC50 values ranked um, in increasing, at an increasing level um, with um, the highest here and the lowest here. So these individuals are making very good responses these individuals are making no response whatsoever. And this is the 200 line that I pointed out. So in fact, the majority of these individuals would be um, protected based on their neutralizing antibody levels. And if you look at their T cell levels, you can see they're kind of all over the place, but the individuals who had no neutralizing antibodies did have multi-specific T cell responses. And on the next slide, I rank those multi-specific T cell responses um, according to the different um, antigens um, that we've looked at. So they're multi-specific because their T cell response is against antigens other than spike. They're against spike, nuclear protein, membrane protein, and RF3A and 7A. 
And what you can see is that for those individuals that are making no neutralizing antibodies, um, some of them are making um, quite nice multispecific T cell responses. But what you can also immediately see is that there's a completely uncoupled response. So there are individuals that have very high, pardon me, very high neutralizing antibody teeters, uh, but no T cell response um, whatsoever. Um, and there are other individuals that have lower neutralizing antibodies and quite, um, quite decent T cell responses. So quite an important uncoupling. Now, I mentioned earlier that the T cell responses can decline as you go from people with case definition symptoms to non-case definition symptoms to asymptomatic. Um, and that's for spike protein and for nuclear protein. But it's quite reassuring that the neutralizing antibody teters remain high. Um, so the, the, the dark ones here are greater than 200 again. So these remain high and probably protective across individuals independent of the whether they're case definition or asymptomatic. So in terms of summary, the conclusions about adaptive immunity are that there are multi-specific SARS-CoV-2 T cell responses, there are pre-existing T cell responses in pre-pandemic and uninfected exposed healthcare workers, that T cell responses are lower in asymptomatic individuals, that the majority of the healthcare workers had that had become infected had neutralizing antibodies at 89%. Um, probably at levels that are likely to be protective. The worrying thing is that means that 10, 11% of healthcare workers were once again susceptible to reinfection because they didn't have um, neutralizing antibodies. And then you've got higher teeters of neutralizing antibodies as you increase age and also in women. And then lastly, probably very importantly, this uncoupling of the neutralizing antibody and T cell responses. So Marco's done a, a beautiful summary of the vaccine, so I don't have to now, which is great. Um, but um, he obviously pointed out the high efficacy, which is an incredible achievement, um, I think. Um, and the three top three ones that I'm showing here have been rolled out um, in, in, in the UK. Um, but two other studies that he didn't mention that I'd just like to mention because it's of interest to the variant um, strains is that um, we've recently had um, press releases last week from um, Janssen and Novavax about um, their um, efficacy for their um, um, vaccines. And what they found was that, um, for, for example, for the Novavax, va Novavax vaccine, they found in, in a UK study that there was 89% protection. But in that UK study, 50% of the people studied had been infected with the variant strain. And when they split it up for who'd been infected by the variant and who'd been infected by the authentic strain, they found 95% efficacy against the authentic virus and only 85% against the UK variant. And when they looked in their South African um, cohort, they only found 60% efficacy in HIV negative individuals. And in South Africa at the moment, 90% of individuals are in fact getting infected with the variant strain. So that suggests that there might be reduced efficacy of the vaccines um, against um, the um, variant strains. And this is also shown in the Janssen um, data, which is a single shot vaccination, um, where they report 66% efficacy overall, 72% in the US and only 57% in, in South Africa, um, where, as I said, 90% of the individuals are infected with the variant strain. So, slightly worrying. Anyway, um, just to look at the vaccine responses, this is a slightly different approach to presenting the data. Um, it's, a, it's an analysis based on um, trying to do a sort of head-to-head -head comparison. Um, and what, what, you're, what we're showing here, if I can just focus on these because then I'm following on from Marco, this is obviously the Oxford um, and these are the two RNA vaccines. So um, you've got the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. And so you can see that it looks like the Moderna vaccine's got the higher levels of um, binding antibodies, but closely followed by um, the um, Pfizer um, and the Oxford vaccine. And then if you move on to neutralizing antibody responses, um, what we see here, um, if you look at um, the scale, you can see that the Novavax study has and, and also the um, Janssen study have very high um, neutralizing antibody responses. And then the um, CHADOX and the RNA vaccine are head to head. And the key point I was going to highlight here, which Marco also highlighted, was the importance of the second dose in the RNA vaccines, which you see very nicely here. 
uh, where if individuals haven't received the second dose of the vaccine, they're really, you know, a log down on their responses um, and in a kind of danger zone for potentially um, not actually being protected. So in conclusion, most people who have had mild or asymptomatic natural infection have T-cell and antibody responses. Um, and the majority have actually quite good neutralizing antibody responses that are still there in 90% of infected cases um, at 16 to 18 weeks post-infection. The danger with that statement is 10% of those individuals had not got um, um, neutralizing antibody responses and may well be susceptible to reinfection. So we don't know how long antibodies last. We don't know if they last greater than a year. And at the moment, we don't know what is the correlate of protection from reinfection. Uh, T cell antibody responses are often uncoupled and human coronavirus data suggests that we could have be facing problems with antibody and T cell responses um, not being sustained and individuals possibly getting reinfected even on an annual basis. So it's enormously important at this stage in the, in the game that we closely monitor immunity over the coming months with a special vigilance uh, to look for evidence of reinfection, to monitor responses to vaccination very closely and assess vaccine efficacy, uh, particularly in relation to um, the variant strains. Different vaccine platforms generate different immune responses and as Marco pointed out T cell responses seem to be very good um, in the Oxford um, vaccine and neutralizing antibody responses seem to be um, good across the board. Um, two of the vaccine studies that I've just presented to you um, possibly report, reported in press releases possibly indicated reduced efficacy against the South African and UK variant strains um, and so what that means is that we really do need to, as much as possible, accelerate vaccine mass rollout at as high an efficacy as possible so that we reduce any possible selective advantage to variants. Um, we also may need to update vaccines using multiple targets and boosts in the future. And in order to be able to do that effectively, we need to have the infrastructure um, and the regulatory mechanisms in place so that you can rapidly design and make new vaccines, conduct the preclinical and clinical studies, obtain regulatory approval at pace, and then scale up and production and deliver mass rollouts. It's also, a as a matter of caution, it's important that we avoid protocol adjustments that may partially reduce vaccine efficacy, because if you partially reduce vaccine efficacy at this crucial time during the pandemic, you actually could create a situation where you confer a fitness advantage to variant strains or that favours immune escape, which could create problems um, in the future. Um, so this is really just to say that um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we really cautioned that um, the key way to control SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, was to, to stop transmission. Um, and, um, and that was really going to be achieved um, through, through, you know, good solid um, vaccination strategies. And I think that's the end. So thank you very much. That's, that's wonderful, Rosemary. Thank you very much. So much information, um, some encouraging and some slightly worrying. <laughs> so we've come to the questions now and uh, we're going to go in turn. So Tobias, do you want to um, start with some? Yeah. <clears throat> we have a huge number of questions and I, We'll start with one which come very often. This is long-term effect of the vaccine. So to both of you, what, what do you expect? How long the efficiency will stay? And will we need a, a booster vaccination after a year like influenza, like flu, uh, every year uh, vaccination? I, I, I know there's no data available, but what is your expectation? Maybe, Rose, you will start. Um, so, I, I mean, the, the, the general immunologist's answer would be that following vaccination, you'll have a mo more potent response and possibly a more sustained long, longevity. Um, and so, so I would definitely predict that. Um, I think the early, you know, the vaccine studies that we've seen sh so far show very good, very potent responses in terms of neutralizing antibodies that clearly are in line with um, what we've seen in natural infection and if in many ways better. So when people are boosted, they're substantially better. 
Um, and I am relatively certain that I would bet that the vaccination will last, the protection from vaccination will last longer than from natural infection. And the advantage of vaccines is that if, if, if it does wane, then you can boost. Um, whether or not you'll need an annual vaccination like the flu vaccine, I don't know. I think that depends a lot on what happens with all these variants. And my, my firm belief is that we have to vaccinate to high efficacy within the community to prevent the increase of variants. And that's a key thing to do so that we're not forced into a position where we have to do um, repeated vaccinations against variant strains, which would be um, quite, quite complex. Uh, I think over to Marco. Anything to add, Marco? Oh, I completely agree with uh, Rosemary. And, uh, and I believe, you know, these vaccines are showing that they are really potent uh, in inducing a very strong humoral response. So, of course, we don't have yet data beyond three months, but it looked that the, the trajectory would be that you will have neutralizing antibodies for quite a while. Uh, the point here is indeed the variants. You know, if the variants will start so popping up, uh, we may have to think about uh, giving booster with, uh, with a different strain in the vaccine. Uh, even if, of course, uh, this will be more to reducing the rate of um, um, uh, viral replication in the upper respiratory tract, and maybe we still have good protection in the lower respiratory tract with this vaccine, including the T-cell component that Rosemary was referring to. So a, a lot to be learned, but I, I would not be over pessimistic on the fact that this vaccine could, could elicit quite a sustained protection in the longer term. Of course, the variance is something that we as regulators, we are already working into what it would take in order to approve vaccines with, with a different strain. Thank you. The, the next question is also for you, Marco. You talked about AstraZeneca, BioNTech, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson and & Johnson, but worldwide, and some of the participants uh, mentioned this, uh, the Chinese vaccine and Sputnik V, the Russian vaccine is now in place. Any information about this? And uh, is there anything the European Medical Agency has to decide in the near future about the Chinese, which both are adenovirus vector vaccines, about the two vaccines? Yeah, uh, this has been in the public domain and there has been a huge media interest on this. Uh, uh, we are discussing with the, the Gamaleya Institute for, for the Sputnik and we are trying to understand if what they've done could be suitable for a potential approval in the European Union. Uh, of course, we will need also to look a lot of different aspects like uh, the, the standards used for manufacturing that they have to be the same that we would require in Europe. Uh, but of course, we are very much uh, interested to understand what these data are telling us and whether these heterologous prime boosts, which in actual fact uh, is not a bad idea at all, uh, is really delivering uh, interesting data. And so we are very much open for approving this vaccine, provided that, of course, you know, that our standards are met. With respect to the Chinese vaccine, essentially, we are in, in touch with uh, Sinovac for this inactivated virus vaccine. Uh, and there we need again to discuss with them uh, uh, all the various aspects for manufacturing, but also the data in terms of efficacy, as we've seen in Brazil, that the efficacy was not uh, as high as other vaccines. And so uh, that is something that definitely we will have to be discussing with them in detail to have a good understanding of, of the level of protection of this vaccine. Well, one thing I would just add to Marco's comments um, is that with the adenovirus 6 um, platforms, there is a problem. Um, which is that in some of them you get a host host immunity against the adenovirus and 50% of the potency can be wiped out very, very quickly. So that's one of the hidden worries about that particular platform. Thank you both. Um, going back to one controversial question, um, which uh, uh, stirred up a lot of controversy over the weekend is the Chadox AZ vaccine in the elderly. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I'd like to ask you both your views on that, um, the comments, it's quite quasi effect effective. And secondly, there's an interesting question just come in on at the other end of life of use in children. We know the trials are not done yet, but off-label use in high-risk children. So Marco, if you wanted to start and then Rosemary. 
Yeah, so uh, the, the bottom line is that we don't have estimate of protection in subject older than 55 years of age from the clinical trials because there were too few subjects above 55 that were included and, few, and too few cases that were collected, uh, cases of COVID-19, I mean, they were collected in this study. So uh, we don't really know if the protection in the elderly will be exactly the same as we see in, ad in adults. That's, that's the, the, the matter of the debate. We approve it for the elderly too, because you know, despite the fact that we don't have this evidence, first of all, from a safety perspective, we had at least 1,000 subjects above 65 years of age, and we didn't see any problem. Actually, reactogenicity is milder in the elderly than in adults, which also could be an important factor. And secondly, we saw that the immunogenicity, as I showed to you before, is pretty okay and is not different or significantly different from what we see in, in adults. This is not something that happens normally with the more traditional vaccine that we've seen in the past, if you think about the influenza one, you know, where immunogenicity really dropped dramatically in the elderly compared to adults. So the fact that the immunogenicity is retained and based on the fact that the safety is fine, we did not feel like the benefit risk here can be considered negative. On the contrary, we think that Probably there is a good, a good, good value to use this vaccine also in the elderly. Of course, you know, it would have been great to have clear cut estimate of what is the level of protection and not forgetting that in the elderly, what matters the most is protection from severe disease and hospitalization. And based on the signal that we have in, in adults, so we may think that this vaccine could, could do the job as well in the elderly. I, I cannot agree more, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of questions with regard to comorbidities and for the Respiratory Society allergic reaction, <clears throat> which has been reported by using the BioNTech uh, vaccine is one of them. So is it a real problem and are there special recommendations for allergics with regard to different vaccines? No, I think uh, so far, I mean, a lot of allergic subjects were included in the studies, like in the Moderna one, but also the Shadox one and the Pfizer-BioNTech, including asthmatic. They were very well represented in the trials and nothing really of concern emerged in this population. So that is extremely reassuring. Now, we have this case of, so of severe allergic reactions, uh, which essentially has been... Uh, in the most of the cases in, in subject with an history of anaphylaxis or severe allergies, particularly to food uh, or medicine in general. And as you know, there is a lot of discussion around the role of PEG as a potential immunogen that might be behind this. The reality is that we don't know yet, uh, but I have to say that now this has not been uh, uh, coming up as really major after the first phase of the vaccination campaign. So we are monitoring closely, but we don't feel there is anything really to be worried for uh, people that have uh, allergies uh, that, you know, are not severe. And even with the severe one, there is no reason for us to contraindicate. Simply, you have to be careful and, uh, and uh, monitoring what is happening in the, in the minutes after the vaccination. Thank you, Marco. There's uh, several questions too on the delay in the second dose um, up, up to 12 weeks. Rosemary, do, do, I mean, the question is what evidence is that based on? <laughs> of course, yes, we know regulators regulate and then public health people are, yeah. use those so, recommendations. So I, I think um, when you look at the, um, the graphs that Marco showed and also the graphs that I showed, I think the thing that's very striking, particularly in the elderly, as people get older, you know, in older populations, is that you really do need the second boost to move logarithmically across the scale to go from having a pretty pathetic neutralizing antibody response to a good solid neutralizing antibody response that would normally be, you know, we don't really know the correlate of protection, but you think would be a correlate of protection. So the real problem is um, when you look at those those graphs shooting across or not, is that if you've only given someone an RNA vaccine with the first dose, there is a real worry that they don't have sufficient um, neutralizing antibody responses to to actually um, to actually be protective. That's the real worry. 
although Marco also showed that other graph, which is what fuels the debate, isn't it? Um, where if that's the case, why are you seeing why are you seeing that apparent um, um, efficacy? And, and we don't we don't know the answer to that. But I think based on the neutralizing antibody um, data, that does you know make you feel cautious about that approach. What, what do you think, Marco? Oh, I, I have to say that I completely agree with you, Rosemary. I'm, uh, you know, we see this effect that was not expected. I don't think anybody was expecting to see already such a level of protection after the first dose. But again, it's a very short interval. We're talking about three weeks, and it would be important, you know, to look what happens after three weeks. Because mm -hmm. indeed, as you said, and uh, it's what I, you know, I try to show in my slides too, the fact that the level of neutralizing antibodies are really close to zero after the first dose is worrisome. Even if we don't know exactly the course of protection, we know from the macaque studies that have been conducted and you alluded to that they matter. They are quite important for protection from symptomatic COVID-19. So, uh, so there is still a lot to learn, but clearly there, is, uh, there are good reasons for being a bit concerned about allowing single dose for this messenger RNA and not giving a booster very soon. Mm. And, and my other concern, which I leave to in the discussion. Uh, a, very a very sophisticated question from my side. So at the moment, we give the boost with the same vaccine we used for the initial vaccination. Uh, what do you think uh, about, let me say, heterolog vaccination? So starting with one and using another uh, for boost vaccination. Is this something which could be risky or is it something which could be taken into account having in mind that some of the vaccines uh, may be not available for a given time? So who's gonna go first? <laughs> Well, I, I, think, I think if you believe in if you believe in clinical and scientific research, um, you know there's a reason why we have clinical trials, isn't there, to assess what works and what's safe and what it means. Um, so, so the cautious part of me feels very uncomfortable about that because I don't really know, and I wouldn't be able to put my hand on my heart and say what I think that would mean in terms of um, someone's immune response. So I guess. Um, the answer is I don't know, and I don't think anybody does. Um, Marco, what do you think? Oh, I completely agree with you. And of course, for me as a regulator, we are always extremely cautious with these kind of approaches. Uh, in terms of public health decision, maybe sometimes you have to allow something exceptional to happen, but without having some study that shows that everything is okay and that you will not have any problem, I think we, we have to be careful. We, we may think that, you know, Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna, if, if you mix them, probably nothing really major will happen. But the reality is that we simply don't know. So it would be great if somebody is doing a small studies, you know, to just check that reactogenicity is okay and that the immune response after all is fine. So uh, a typical also... example could be a severe allergic reaction to a mRNA vaccine so would you boost it? And then uh, it could be a boost with a adenovirus vector vaccine. Indeed, indeed. And that, that is what probably is maybe more interesting is to, is to mix a different type of technologies. But again, if, even there, I would like to see good data in terms of the immunogenicity particular. Also not forgetting that it's very important what is the vaccine that you use to prime with. Uh, and therefore, it would be good to have studies that look at the two options so that we can have a good understanding whether it's good to prime with one and then boost with the others or what could be the best strategy. But before having data, you know, to go straight into just doing that, I, I find it quite risky. Mm -hmm. So we have five minutes left. So I would try to find the questions which are uh, <laughs> uh, mo mostly addressed and one is what, what is with patients who had suffered from COVID-19? Should they be vaccinated? And if yes, when, uh, which time between the disease and the vaccine? Marco, do you wanna go first? Okay. Uh, I think, you know, Rosemary showed a very nice slide to, that, that I like the fact that, 
whoever had an history of COVID-19, uh, the immune response can be extremely heterogeneous. Uh, you don't know exactly how many neutralizing antibodies they have, what has been the T cell response. And therefore, you know, in principle, it would be good that also these people get vaccinated as, as a certain point in time. I can fully understand the public health authority may not prioritize this group, but it would be a mistake to consider that they are protected and therefore they don't need to be vaccinated. Now, uh, people with an history of COVID-19 were not included in the clinical trials, but there were some seropositive subjects included in all the clinical trials with all the free vaccines. And I've seen a few data because, of course, in terms of protection, the, the, the numbers were too small for, for saying much. But in terms of the immune response, it's pretty clear that maybe in subject with an history of COVID-19, you may not need to give two doses. Unfortunately, we don't know yet, but it would be great to do some study that really look into what is the immune response after you receive a single dose, because indeed, probably there you're more in a booster scenario and a single shot would do the job. So I, 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 I'm going to echo what, what Marcos just said. I guess he knew I was going to do that. But I think I think in many ways, obviously, I think the heterogeneity of the response is the problem because you can't predict exactly what you're going to get next. Um, and I don't think people should be denied vaccines because they've had a history of infection. I think that would, could be a huge mistake. But also, I think having had an infection could be a prime. So when you give your first vaccination, you're actually boosting. And so what we need to do is look at responses in people who have been previously um, infected and see how they respond when they're vaccinated and then make a judgment call about how strong that response is um, and what the quality of that response is and the longevity of that response and ad adjust our schedules accordingly. So I, I, I know the data which are not published from two of the companies we talked about today and about 150 patients which had been vaccinated and had been infected uh, in, a, in a given time frame to the vaccine. The antibody response is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much, much higher than the antibody response uh, in pure vaccination. And the boost does not enhance the antibody response in any way. So the first vaccination is a kind of boost to what happened uh, during the disease. Mm. So that all, doesn't all, altogether, me. I'm not against in vaccinating. I personally, I'm not against in vaccinating uh, people who suffered from the disease. It's much more easier as longer uh, the disease uh, uh, had been gone, but I think at the moment there's no need for a boost or boost vaccination. Hmm. And just going to the other end of the spectrum, uh, a few people have been asking about uh, vaccination in immunosuppressed patients, and I, you know, mentioned they weren't included in trials. We just vaccinate them and then hope we get some kind of response. Is that the clinical aim? Yeah. Um, I, I, Please, please, husband. No, you, you go ahead. That's fine. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, uh, no, I, I, uh, yeah, of course, you know, unfortunately, in, in the pre licensure study conducting in the midst of a pandemic, you, you cannot expect that there is a, a good coverage of this, <coughs> even if we want to know. Of course, all of us want to know what is happening when these groups get vaccinated. So, uh, in the post-approval phase, we are trying to have some studies, even randomized controlled trial, looking into immunogenicity and safety in some of these groups. But the problem is that the immunocompromised patient is such a large group of different type mm -hmm. of, uh, of immunocompromised subject with, with different mechanism that is so difficult to have a single study that will address all, all the needs and all the questions. So, of course, I saw in the chat anti-TNF, of course, that is a very large group, so most likely will be one of those addressed. But like the anti-CD20 therapy, that's also a very important one. And then it's very difficult to have data throughout all this group in the in randomized controlled trial post-approval. Uh, and the other problem is that, of course, even if we see the, immunogen the immune response being lower, what does it mean in terms of protection without a call to protection? So it's that's the, the, the other dilemma, and that's why it would be good anyway to have good effectiveness studies that will look into this population to try to understand what is happening. But I guess it would be great if learned societies and different academic groups, they try to set up studies 
in which they try at least to measure the immune response in these various groups so that we have a good picture of a role of, of what is happening in all these different patient populations. So I completely well, agree with what Marco just said, but to I think have the, other a, thing, the other a thing I would pragmatic say. Pragmatic approach and Tobias, then we... Tobias, Rosemary is just going to finish off. Sorry. Yeah, I, I um, only want sorry. one statement. I, I, to have a pragmatic approach, I think, in the autoimmune patients, we should stay with the given treatment, the treatment for the autoimmune disease, and then vaccinate and not reduce uh, the immunosuppressive drugs because we do not know what will happen. Anita, you, you have the final words. I'll just let Rosemary finish off and then we... we... Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so all, all I was going to say is it's a very heterogeneous group, as Marco has very clearly said. So I think it's a situation where you've got to do the small studies, but also you've got to almost treat it like personalised medicine. So from the type of immunosuppression that the person has or the disease that they have from an immunologist point of view can sort of predict what you might expect to happen with the vaccine and so you could almost choose which vaccine might work best for that individual if you had a choice um, and I think that's what we might end up having to do so if you had patients with CVID you can imagine that they might develop t-cell immunity but but not antibody etc cetera, etc cetera. so I, I think it, it's, it's a situation where it's so complicated, it's not appropriate to think about it in terms of a mass population-based rollout. It's got to be individual personalised medicine. Thank you, Rosemary. I think we've learned a huge amount uh, this evening. Um, I, I'm really grateful to the speakers, to Tobias. We probably have to come back and do this again at, at, at some point, but thank you all for attending and thank you, Marco and Rosemary and Tobias and good night. Pleasure, thank you very thank much. You all. Thank you. It was a fantastic meeting and all the best to all the participants and thank you Ali Matschok from ERS for organizing it. Thanks.